UTMB, race done, and one second. I've got the finishers, Julie. So here's a summary of how the race panned out for me. Before I get into the details of the race, I just want to say a hello to the four runners. Four runners that recognize me from the channel. I was, and I apologize if I got your name wrong, but Paul, right at the start, probably the first commenter, the first person I said hello to when I saw a British flag, recognized me from the channel. I think it was Paul, so nice to meet you and I hope you had a good race. There was Stuart who I was speaking to, and then he had the misfortune of hearing me complain about an incident, which we'll get on to later. I think it was Michael who was from Ireland as well. I subsequently ran probably 140, 150 kilometers after speaking to these guys, so I do apologize if you got your name wrong. And then from France, Jean Michel. So, hello guys, I really nice to meet you and really good chatting to you and sharing your trails with you. I hope you all had great races. Right, on to a summary of the race. So in this video, I'm just going to break up the race starting at the very beginning before I started and then by each major aid station and just talk you through how the race went for me. So right at the very beginning, I got to the start area about 45 minutes before the race was due to start and the aim of that was to try and get around halfway in the pack. Um, but it was already absolutely crowded by the time I got there. And it's probably the busiest race start I've ever been to. One of the things which I found quite strange was, was quite a few people had friends standing with them in the kind of running start area, which essentially they just got in the way, in my view. Um, I left my supporters, went there by myself. But ultimately, it was very, very busy. There was also a heavy rain shower, so some of these friends and family had umbrellas up and things like that in the runner's kind of start area. Um, but yeah, I was quite happy for the rain. It had been quite humid, so I was hoping that would clear the air a little, and it helped a little bit, but it was still very hot when we started at 6 p.m. The build-up to the actual start was incredible. The noise, the music, the compares and the MCs were just like, building up the crowd. They're doing the, the clapping, which you have in this sort of Icelandic clap, and that kind of stuff. The music was just building and building, and then we were off. And... As is often the way with these big races, it was a little bit stop-start over the first kilometre or two getting out of Chamonix. But as it's on fairly wide trails and track for the first 10, 12 kilometres, it was okay and able to run at a, a kind of your own pace reasonably well for the most part. Because of the rain shower, there was quite a few big puddles as well, so that caused more congestion as people were trying to avoid them so they didn't get wet feet with 170 kilometres left to run. But I've never had a start like that when you're running and probably for the first two kilometers at least the crowd were two, three deep on both sides of the road and it was just an absolute amazing experience, all clapping, cowbells and music. So really, really exciting. At the start I checked my heart rate when I was just standing waiting for it to begin and it was over 100 and my resting heart rate is probably half of that. So it was showing just sort of the, the build up and the nerves, the excitement on my heart rate. So on that first section, it's predominantly downhill towards the first sort of little aid station and timing point, which was at Leuge, and I took it very steady. I went through the time map there at Leuge about 1400 and something, so I was well down the field at that point, and that was the aim. I'd purposely planned, as I mentioned, to start a bit further back, in the field so I didn't go up too fast and it would get swept along and even the small climbs I have just walked them off right from the start I wasn't trying to run up any of them I didn't want any little accelerations if someone was in front of me who was going slower and I wanted to pass them I didn't get frustrated and try and do any sprints I just took my time and waited for a natural gap to occur amongst the runners and we'd go around them then and it was all very controlled and just enjoying the experience it was clear when we got to Leuche, they hadn't had any rain there either, and it was really humid. And on the next section, there's a climb, which is about 800 meters of ascent in total, and then you drop down more than that into Saint Gervais. And on that climb, my shorts were just absolutely saturated with sweat. It was so hot and humid in that section. 
my plan had been from a nutrition point of view that I was going to run from Chamonix and not make use of the aid station at Leuche or Saint Gervais and then wait to the next one a bit further up because I thought I could get there within four hours and that's when I then fill up both of my bottles. However, I knew that I had to drink more with the amount that I was sweating. I definitely didn't want to get dehydrated that early on into the race. And so I ended up actually getting a bottle in Saint Gervais or topping up my bottle in Saint Gervais, just one of them. And then I was still planning to have a bigger stop at the, 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 the Contamine aid station a bit further up. So I got into uh, Saint Gervais, the descent was fine, I took it very easy. I got my head torch out, I just had it in the side pocket so it was nice easy access and put that on for some of the darker sections where the trees were a bit thicker as the sun was beginning to set and go down at this time. And came into Saint Gervais and when I did the course recce I wanted to be within 10% of that time, not and by that either slower or faster. I didn't want to be going too fast. So I'd averaged 7.1 kilometers per hour when I did my recce to that point and I checked my watch and I was on 7.6 so I was happy with that. I knew I hadn't gone too fast to that point. Between Leouche and uh, Saint Gervais I think I gained over 300 places which I was really surprised at. I'm honest I didn't feel like I was overtaking that many people but that could be something to do with when you cross the start map versus when you cross the other timing maps and things like that and just people slowly kind of finding their position in the race. Coming out of Saint Gervais, Head Torch was then on for the full time. Again, absolutely amazing atmosphere in that heat station. Asterix Noblets were running around, cheering on the crowds. It was uh, absolutely fantastic. And again, you were just lined on both sides of the streets, loads of people out high-fiving. And then after that, you kind of got onto a bit of a track, a bit of flat, and then it's a slow, gradual, undulating climb up to Lake Contamine. And again, I was conscious I didn't want to go too fast. My plan for the race was very much running that section to that the Contamine A station very controlled and then there was a long climb and it was going to be a good test of how I was feeling when I got onto that long climb post the Contamine. Coming out of Saint Gervais was feeling really really good and I was going down a, a slight descent and then there was a bridge to cross and it was made out of wood with just like wooden planks and the runner in front of me for some reason even though it was completely flat was using his poles. Um, again, at this point it was completely black, uh, dark, had the head torch on. Anyway, so he was running, got his pole stuck in the gap between the wooden planks, let go of it and it kind of spring-loaded back and hit me in a delicate area, shall we say, and that doubled me over instantly. I was completely winded. I just felt absolutely dreadful. I was ready to throttle the guy, if I'm honest. Um, There's nothing I could do to get out of the way of it, because again, it was still quite crowded at this point with a lot of runners, and it just literally in front of me, it could not have been worse timing. I attempted partially to hurdle it. However, no, it just it got me absolutely perfectly in the probably the worst place I could have been hit. Um, to be fair, he was very, very apologetic and he was trying to help me, but I just sort of waved him on and I sort of moved to the side of the bridge to try and catch some, uh, catch my breath, really. Um, I then tried, there was a bit of a climb out of, off the bridge and I got about halfway up it and I was trying to catch my breath and I ended up throwing up. And this was just over three hours into the race. Now, I knew that I needed to keep food in me. Um, however, for the next nine hours, I was unable to do so. I'd been following my nutrition strategy. I was having a man to fuel feel good bar every half hour, like so one per hour, half of a bar every half hour, if that makes sense, as well as having some of the energy drink. And then I probably saw all of those bars again, at least some of them. So I was not in a very good way. I made it to the next aid station and I took a little bit of time there. And I wasn't feeling too bad, to be honest, apart from on the downhills where there was a bit more bounce, shall we say, and it was hurting a lot in the lower abdomen. Um, but I was able to get to that next aid station where I refilled my bottles and tried to sort of get my plan back in place. I then started on the long climb and again, 
point to the timing splits, I made up some places in that section, which was quite surprised at because I was getting overtaken a lot. And the only thing I can think of is I must have made up all of those places when going through the San Gervais aid station and people must have just been there taking a bit longer than I did. So I made up a lot, of, I made up some places there. And again, to the next timing map at La Balm, again, I'd also made up some places and it must have just been I was quite quick through the aid station. So I started hiking up and every time I tried to eat something, it came back up. I couldn't eat, uh, drink anything. I made it to La Balm and I was really still feeling okay at this point. I was able to sort of hike but not really put any real power into it, but I was going at a reasonable pace. And then after that it gets into single track and a bit steeper and I got about another, probably now about three quarters of the way up the call. And um, that's when I got a bit of cramp, probably because I was dehydrated, I wasn't able to eat or drink anything. And so I tried the hot shots, if you've seen the previous video, tried a hot shot and I was really impressed. It, it worked, whether it was placebo, whether there is the benefits there, but the cramp disappeared. And I was able to keep it inside me for long enough that I um, got the benefit of it. The other thing is I sat for about five minutes and I felt okay once I kind of got going again a little bit. Um, made it over the top of the call and descended and I gained places on the descent and I knew I was overtaking people there. I was running it at what I felt was a very, very easy pace, but descending is always my strength. So it was at night with the head torches on and I was just finding it quite easy, especially as soon as you got ever so slightly technical, a bit rocky, that's where I was gaining places on people were taking it slower than me. So having prepared in advance what I would do if I started throwing up, even though I've never thrown up before an ultra marathon or I was feeling bad, I knew that the aid stations where there was beds, for example, where I could lie down, get a decent sort of space to just chill out for a little period. And so my plan had been that I was formulating whilst I've been walking up the pole that I was going to go and I was going to stop and lie down for 20 minutes. I also knew that that aid station had hot food and they always talk about the soup at UTMB. So when I got there, I got a cup of soup and I didn't have the noodles or anything added to it because the aid station said they had the kind of what we would probably call like a bouillon, just a, a clear soup. And then you could add in some aid stations rice or other ones had little pasta like noodles. You could add to them if you want some more carbohydrates. So I just had the, the liquid element and then I lay down for 20 minutes. I got back up, I had another cup of just the liquid and then I sat for another 10 minutes after that. In total I was probably in that aid station for about 45 minutes because there was another really long climb coming up and I made it maybe three quarters of the way up that climb before I began to struggle again. I got to the summit of that next call and the um, sort of first aid medical crew, checkpoint crew up at the top and you had a little temporary shelter and so I asked if I could sit in there and just eat something and be out the wind for five minutes, which they were happy for me to do. So again, I sat there, got on some more clothes um, because it was getting quite cold. Uh, at this point, I was getting cold anyway, up at about 2,500 meters. Ate some food, waited another five, 10 minutes to try and let it digest a little and then started next to scent. And that was then my nutrition strategy going forward because I was able to have a bit of solid food as well as then run afterwards. But as soon as I tried to do it when I was actually running still, it was making me nauseous. So did that, next ascent was okay. And then the next climb started overtaking people. The next ascent down to the La Combo aid station was a bit more technical. And again, a lot of places in that descent. Got to the aid station, had some soup. This time I had some noodles in there as well. And then I just sat for about 15 minutes after I'd finished eating. And then I headed off and after that I just started ticking off people in front of me and just targeting them and overtaking them and that was my approach going forward. Next climb, power hiking, I gained places and it's rare for me to overtake people in power hiking. As I mentioned in previous videos that's my weakness but I was able to gain quite a few places there which was a good confidence boost as well. The sun was now up which was just fantastic, the views were amazing and I carried on along the next section of undulating trail and then there's a steep technical descent down into Kurmayer and 
basically each time point I was just gaining places and I took it very slow actually on that descent because I wanted to make sure my legs weren't trashed for later on in the race. Got into Kilmaier which is where my drop bag was and had a lot of food in there including some uh, rice puddings which were very easy to digest so I had a couple of little sash, uh, pots of rice pudding and a few other bits and pieces. I had spare shoes, spare change of clothes, everything really. Didn't touch any of it, my feet were feeling fine. My clothes, no chafage, anything like that. Everything I've tried in training was working really well at this point, about 80 kilometers in. So, other than put some sun cream on, nothing changed for the uh, second half of the race, really. Same pack, same equipment. Stocked up again with some uh, a couple of bars, but I didn't actually need to take that much of the food I'd packed because I hadn't been able to eat any of it. I'd just been using the aid station soup at this point. But that was the first time I was really beginning to introduce a few more you know, solid foods into me my diet. At this point the sun was up fully and it was getting quite hot and there was a very steep climb up to Refugio Berton and again on that climb I gained a lot of positions and got to that aid station, topped up my bottles, had some food and then set off and this time I probably only waited five minutes after eating before going. And then the next section I really wanted to run as much as that's possible. Um, when it was flat, our sort of slight uphills and the downhills, and I was able to do that. Gained a good number of positions again, and just went through the Benati aid station without taking any food, down to the next one at Arnavaz, where I took a bit longer because I knew there was a big climb coming up, so I took on some more food, took my time, and then headed out. Now, I probably spent, uh, by this point, over two hours just sat in aid stations or lying down in these stations, trying to digest the food. But the next climb was takes you up to the highest point of the race, I believe, up over the Grand Coupere. So I started the power hike up. I was chatting with a fellow runner for quite a large section of it, and Jean Michel. And then my approach to power hiking and these sort of climbs is just try and get to my rhythm and just stick to it. So I was very anti-social and I apologize if you're watching this. I just kind of put my head down and set off. Got to the top of Grand Coupere feeling really good and I knew there was a very long descent. And that descent from Grand Coupere until the climb to uh, Champelac is about 22 kilometers and it is a bit undulating in places but you probably only gain two, 300 meters over that total distance. So I knew that I had to pace it well from the start. So it was just about trying to run as conservatively as possible but also one where I'd be able to take people and what I've been doing and I've been looking at my timing sheet and when I left the aid station where I had basically spent 45 minutes and lay down on the bed that they had there for 20 minutes I left there knowing that I was about 20 minutes ahead of my 46 hour schedule that I'd set out for myself and then I was slowly catching up on my 40 hour schedule so when I got to Cormier I think I was 45 minutes behind it or so and then the next aid station I was 35 minutes and then 20 minutes. Once I got down to La Fouli, which is about maybe halfway down that long descent, I got ahead of my 40 hour schedule, which I was delighted with. The next one was the 35 hour one, but obviously I was getting further into race and it was getting harder to make up the time difference. But at that point, I said to myself, if I can get to uh, Champelac with which would then leave 45 kilometers to the end. If I can get there in under, what would it be, 26 hours, give myself nine hours, then potentially, potentially, I could get a 35 hour race in. I knew it was a big ask, but that's what I was telling myself. That was my drive, that was my motivation at this point. So I left the fully and I just pushed really hard at this point into Champagne Lac and I was aiming to get there said for 26 hours and I got there in 25 hours and about 45 minutes or so which I thought was great because it gave me 15 minutes where I could take food in and then sit and let it digest for 10 minutes and then leave after 26 hours which is exactly what I did. The next aid station or the next big one that I was aiming for was Trion which was 17 kilometers further on so over a third of the remaining distance was in that section and it had one big climb from Champagne Lac you've basically got three climbs, in my mind were three climbs, 800 meters of ascent at each of them. That's not exact but I was just trying to keep things simple um, that late on into the race. So leaving Champagne Lac, beginning to go into the second night at this point. I didn't sleep in the first night although I lay down. 
I didn't sleep at any point during that period. And I was undecided as to whether I was going to try and nap. And I was basing it on if I started yawning or having any hallucinations or anything like that, then I was going to sleep in an aid station. But leaving there, I was feeling good. I knew there was a very slight climb out of the town and then it was a gradual runnable section and I told myself I had to run all of that and again I was just slowly taking runners one at a time. When I got about halfway down the descent I knew that with the darkness I wasn't able to get the descending speed that I wanted also my quads were beginning to hurt a little bit. So at that point I kind of um, decided that coming to Triomphe that that wasn't on and so rather than risking injury, just be sensible and finish, I'd easily achieve sub 40 hours if I was just sensible and didn't blow up. And if I needed to sleep or anything like that, I still had that option. But I went into Trion Aid Station, which was basically just like a party. There was a DJ playing, there was massive crowds. I was chatting to some of the supporters who had runners in the race and they were there crewing them. Um, chap from America and he was supporting his friend who was doing the race. And yeah, again, took some food on spent some time, listened to some cheesy music. Daddy Cool was playing, I remember that, at two o'clock in the morning or whatever time it was. And then the next climb, and that's the first point in the race that I felt tired, not in I was gonna fall asleep, but my legs, I just didn't have the energy to really drive it and push on in that climb. And this is uh, probably about 135 kilometers in or so at this point maybe slightly more. So I got to the summit uh, of the call and was feeling okay, but again, just took it easy on the descent. I just, I really wasn't enjoying that section of the course. I got angry at the climb, I got angry at the descent and was really happy to get into the final big aid station at Valoracine. And again, there was just a really good atmosphere. I chatted to some supporters, had a really good chat with one of the volunteers as well. He was an English guy who was helping out and just had a really good chat with him as I was eating my food and just letting it digest. So my whole nutrition plan was eating the aid stations. The only thing I was able to keep down when I was actually on the go was the mountain fuel uh, gels, the sports jellies that I had with me. And so I was relying on them in between. But essentially my nutrition strategy was eat more than I really wanted to in the aid station, let it digest for a few minutes, leave feeling over full, and a bit rubbish on the first part of the climb and then I'd feel great for the second half of the climb essentially and hopefully on to the next descent as well. Then left the final big aid station and basically just sort of hiked it up and I was feeling quite tired at this point. I made it up um, the last big climb, lost a few places there I think, maybe gained one or two, I'm not too sure. And then there's a sort of flatter section and then the final descent and on that flat section um, from Tête au Vent to Flégère I was yeah I knew I would get home at this point I knew I'd be able to get under sort of 37 hours um, without having to push very hard which I was going to be really happy with so I just went at my own speed a couple of guys passed me I just let them go to be fair I probably didn't have much left to push um, this was when I was quite far away from the aid station by this point as well, so I was beginning to fly. Got to Flagère and just knew there was just a long eight kilometer descent, losing about, I think it said 920 meters on the board, if memory serves me correct, and headed down. And this was the final descent, and obviously that's the point that my head torch battery decided that it needed to be replaced with my spare battery. So in, in, in the pitch black, trying to get my head torch battery swapped without another light source unless I opened up my spare head torch, but I decided that I wouldn't do that. So I managed to change that and about five minutes later the sun started coming up. Um, and then got down into the outskirts of Chamonix, which was an absolutely amazing feeling. I ran through the streets and anybody who was out was just incredible, who was like, you know, out for a morning walk with the dog or just sitting at a cafe having a cup of coffee. This was 10 to 8 in the morning or 10 to 7? I think 10 to 7 in the morning. Yeah. Can't do the maths. Whatever time, early on a Sunday morning, and everyone would stop and cheer you on and clap, which is a very sort of nice experience to have. And I came into Chamonix, 
centre and cross the line and I have to admit I got a little bit emotional, uh, not at the finish line but just before that when I knew I'd made it, just coming in through, through sort of the streets of Chamonix and some like r random people just there uh, cheering you on, stopping what they were doing to cheer you on. Um, but yeah, great and then I got in and saw my support crew who'd come out to Chamonix, um, they got up early, they'd been tracking me all night and I think got about as much sleep as I did, I ate none. But yeah, I crossed the finish line and it was just an absolutely amazing experience and I was really happy with how I'd been able to manage a rubbish situation early on in the race and then progress through and I was also delighted with how my legs felt. But overall, in terms of the race and how it panned out, I think that now, you know, it's a good story to tell. I'm not the slightest bit upset that I didn't achieve 35 hours. As I said, my goal was to finish the race, my first 100 miler, and to feel that strong in the race was just absolutely fantastic. Some of the key takeaways from the race for me was one, that the training had obviously worked really well, feeling that strong that late into the race and actually be able to sort of, you know, race it rather than just hike to the finish felt really, really good. Secondly, I was delighted by the fact that I was able to go two nights without any sleep and I didn't really feel impacted by that. To the point that when I finished, I then went about just a normal day. I went out for lunch with my family and friends. I then went and got my free burger, courtesy of Strava. I then went out for dinner. So yeah, I did have sort of three big meals, um, which was a fondue. And it was only about 9.30, 10 o'clock that I started feeling tired and then I slept for about eight and a half hours, but then got up feeling fine today. So that was a real positive as well. And I think just trying to bank the sleep in the dance was a real benefit. I passed so many people just lying at the side of the trail trying to sleep with a waterproof or survival blanket on, trying to stay warm. At no point did I feel that I needed to do that in any way, shape or form, even in the aid stations. Um, the other one I was really happy about was just the mental side of things. I didn't once consider dropping out and I didn't once feel that I wanted to stay in the aid stations or you know, spend longer there. I was always just keen to get going and get back out on the trail. Having the ambitious goal, that 35 hour target was a real motivator for me for the first part of the second night. Um, and then mentally I knew that when I got to Trion, there was just two climbs left. And by the time I was about seen, I knew that I was going to finish the race essentially, unless you know, I then injured myself. So. Those aspects of the race went really well. I will have a long think about it um, and refine things in my head and work out sort of little tweaks and improvements for the future. But overall, as a learning experience and as a total kind of experience to race 100 miles or more than 100 miles, it was just absolutely fantastic. And I don't think I could have wished for more. There was about a 40% DNF rate this year. People saying the conditions were tough. I think having the opportunity to train in the heat was probably a massive benefit because I didn't feel it was actually bad conditions. There was also a huge thunderstorm, but it happened behind me. It was over Grand Cove Ray and I was luckily enough down before that, so I didn't get any rain to race. But I think if you'd been caught in that, if I'd been an hour behind where I was at that point in the race, then that would have been tough because it would have been beginning to get dark and you would have been wet and cold coming into a nice warm aid station. So the temptation to drop out might have been higher at that point. So that is UTMB 2019 done. Box ticked, absolutely delighted with how it all turned out. And now on to the next one. End of October for me is the next race, 100 kilometers. But it's going to be a lot of rest first and I'm not going to give it any thought for a good few weeks before I uh, get back into my run training. Once again, I'd just like to thank you all for the support, all the messages. I know lots of people were tracking me and, you know, enjoying that. I know I was concerned as well at the start as to why I was so low down in the field and why I hadn't left a certain aid station because I was lying down and then eating soup. Um, but yeah, I really do appreciate it. Uh, UTMB 2020, probably not for me. Maybe in a few years time I might revisit it again. I think if I looked at the total time spent in aid stations and half that easily, that would probably save me a good hour and a half, two hours and then there's probably more time to be made up as well. And if I could finish as strongly as I was all the way to the end, I could have been maybe an hour and 50 quicker just in that last section, let alone the rest of the race. So there's definitely opportunities there to get faster. But for me, this was a 
big kind of a goal for the last three, four years, getting the points and getting into this race. So I'm glad that it's been completed. And now I'm going to take some time because there's some other races on the to-do list that I need to begin to focus on. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, please give it a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any future content. And I'll see you next time.